A Spanish philosopher once said, those who cannot remember their history are bound to repeat it. And this is because history has taught us that we learn nothing from history. But if we pay attention to history, Winston Churchill taught us that the further backward we look, the further forward we are likely to see. This week, the country forgot a moment in history that shook us to the very bone. A moment we are ashamed of, yet a history we cannot ignore. But we ignored it this week. Thursday this week marked the 37th year of the attempted coup d'etat of August 1st, 1982. On this Sunday morning, the country woke up to some shocking news. The government of Daniel Arap Moy had been overthrown by the Kenya Air Force, and a People's Redemption Council had been set up to replace it. In fact, the whole night of July 31st, 1982, was polluted by gunshots as the Air Force soldiers wrestled power from the legitimate government of Arab Moy. They only managed to make the chilling announcement that they had taken over at around 6 a.m. on Sunday, the 1st of August, and the country froze in shock. We knew that Arab Moy was a bad man, but he did not deserve such a harsh exit. And yes, he had turned Kenya into a one-party dictatorship. And yes, he had used the Public Security Act to detain the people he disagreed with. But he did not deserve a military coup. That is why on August 1st, 1982, the country was shocked when the Kenya Air Force took over the only radio station in Kenya and announced that the government of Arab Moy had been overthrown and the People's Redemption Council, headed by senior private Hezekiah Ochuka, had taken over. And for 12 hours, Ochuka, the coup maker, was president of Kenya. Before he was crushed. This is the voice of Kenya Nairobi. Time now is 12 minutes past 6. You are hereby informed that everybody is requested to stay at home. There should be no movement in town. The government has now been taken over by the military until further notice. There should be no movement of persons or vehicles from one place to another. The police should now assume the role of civilian until further notice. For our young viewers, we need to break this down. In 1982, Kenya had only one TV station. It was known as the Voice of Kenya, or VOK. And the station was not a 24-hour station. It opened its services at 5 p.m. with a statement declaring Kufungua Stationi. And at 11 p.m., the station closed with a declaration of Kufunga Stationi. Then a prayer was offered by a priest or by an imam. The radio stations were not different. In fact, there were two stations, both controlled by the government. We had the General Service Station and a National Service Station. One was in English and the other was Swahili. To overthrow the government, therefore, all you needed was to take over the one TV station and the two radio stations. And this is what senior private Hezekiah Ochuka did on August 1st, 1982. He took over the airwaves and declared himself 
president. The coup makers had planned for a long time, but they couldn't agree on the timing of the coup. They had intelligence that another coup was in the offing and wanted to execute theirs ahead of other coup makers. They were also divided on whether to do the coup when Arab Moy was in the country or to execute it when he was away. They settled on doing it when Moy was in Kenya. This way, they would contain him. If he was away, they reasoned, foreign powers would be motivated to reinstall him using sheer force. What is interesting is that Arab Moy was scheduled to travel to Libya to take over leadership of the OAU. But his friend and assistant minister, John Keane, convinced him to cancel the trip for no good earthly reason. With every detail in place, the coup makers chose August 1st, 1982, a Sunday, and the plan was to get arms from the Embakasi barrack where the officers in charge of the armory had agreed to cooperate. They would use the weapons to take over the Kahawa barracks, Eastleigh Air Base and Langata barracks. Everything went as planned. Led by Opuapo Ogai, they bombed the communication line between Mbekasi Barracks and DOD at 3 a.m. And as they were leaving, they were challenged by a group of loyal soldiers resulting in a fierce gun battle. Alarmed by this, the Mbekasi police station alerted police headquarters, who in turn informed DOD of a disturbance. Acting on this information, the takeover of Langata and Kahawa barracks was thwarted. And with this misfortune, the coup began to fall apart. But in the meantime, senior private Hezekiah Ochuka and some soldiers had taken over the voice of Kenya. They had frontmarched the lead TV and radio presenters from their homes to the station. Then, they forced them to read a statement declaring that the government of Arab Moy had been toppled and the Redemption Council had taken over. A statement condemning the deposed government was also read by a university student. In the TV and radio broadcasts, the Redemption Council ordered all policemen to revert to the status of Raiya, or normal citizens. All prisoners were set free, and all MPs were instructed to stay at home, awaiting their arrest. Then the soldiers headed to Kabarak to arrest Arab Moy at his farm. But as they did this, an Air Force bomber dropped a bomb at a house in Muthaiga with the intention of taking out one of Mze Moy's most influential ministers, Charles Njonjo. And in all the excitement, the University of Nairobi students joined in. Unlike today, the University Students' Union was a powerful movement in the 1980s. In fact, the shouts of power comrades chanted by the soldiers had been borrowed from these students. Accompanied by the soldiers, the tempestuous students commandeered a Kenya bus on University Way and drove it to Kenyatta University College to collect comrades from the campus. But as the youthful excitement of the soldiers and the students crescendoed, the coup was falling apart in other spaces. As the rebel soldiers marched towards Kabarak to capture Arab Moy, a fortress of loyal men was forming around the president. The Rift Valley Provisional Commissioner, Hezekiah Oyugi, and a little-known major in the army called Lazarus Sumbewo, had marshaled administrative and military resources to constitute a fortress. Luckily, Sumbewo's brother was the head of the presidential escort, 
and using the resources available to the two brothers, they secured Moy. They took him to an undisclosed location and pondered the options. Like good strategists, the Sumbe War brothers pondered the worst case scenarios first. If the coup makers succeed, what should Arab Moy do? One option was to fly him out of the country from Eldoret or a friendly neighborhood. The other option was to stay home and wage war against the Nairobi rebels from West Pokot. These accounts are deposited in our history, and fortunately, none of them were activated. And this is because another set of loyalists was beginning to form an outer fortress around Arab Moy. The most notable player in this group was an elegant general by the name of Major General Musomba. In the wee hours of the morning on August 1st, 1982, the general received a distress call from George Kimeto, an intelligence officer based in the Rift Valley. Kimeto notified the general that a coup had happened and that the rebel soldiers were marching towards Kabarak. General Musomba was commandant of the now Kenyatta barracks in Gilgil. But because Gilgil is not far from Nakuru, the general lived in Nakuru. This is how he received the distress call while in Nakuru. And from there, he was able to communicate with Arab Moi using the army communication network, which the coup makers had not disabled. Arab Moi instructed him to block the Nairobi Nakuru road at Gilgil, which he did. He was further instructed to send enforcement troops to Nairobi and Nanyuki. What followed these decisive instructions changed the course of our history. But before we talk about this, we must go back to Nairobi. In Nairobi, the amateur soldiers who had planned the coup were falling apart. The support they had expected from the other soldiers did not happen. The coup had failed. It had fallen flat on its face. And realizing this, the coup makers commandeered an aircraft from Isili Air Base and flew into Tanzania where they sought political asylum. As they did this, Arab Moy and General Musomba decided to head towards Nairobi from Kabarak. Moy did not know that the rebel soldiers had run away to Tanzania, but he wanted to face them man to man. Using armored cars and specialized soldiers, General Musomba and Major Sumbeyo delivered Moy to the seat of government in Nairobi. The coup makers were nowhere to be found. They had run away to Tanzania with tails between their legs. Their coup had failed badly. By evening, the country was back and Arab Moy was president again. What was the closure around this coup? How did it end? Arab Moy was back in office on Monday the 2nd of August. In fact, he held a cabinet meeting on the 3rd of August 1982 to show that he was still in charge. But unexpected by many, Arab Moy used the coup attempt to finish all his kingmakers and the kings in waiting. Charles Jonjo was one of the targets here. After the coup, he was accused of being one of the coup planners, among many accusations. They finished him politically. Then, Arab Moy targeted all the Kenyatta politicians and bureaucrats. He finished them one by one. And this is why we must ask the following question. Did Moy know about the coup? And did he allow it to happen? Did he use it to finish his opponents? 
As we ask these questions, we must remember that Moy had intelligence pointing to a coup or an assassination, according to CIA reports. But he ignored it. Was this intentional? What about the coup makers? What happened to them? They all died in prison or custody. If Ochuka died in custody or prison, Titu Andugosi, the university student leader, did not have to die. This was a young student of architecture. Because of his youth, he had hormones pumping like a disco in his blood. This is why he succumbed to folly and supported the coup. But he died because of folly. Then there was the commander of the Kenya Air Force, Major General Karaoke. He was court-martialed and jailed for four years. This did not add up. But the most unexplainable arrest was that of GSCU commander Ben Gevi. This man was detained at the committee maximum prison for months, yet he is the man who provided logistics that defeated part of the coup. Moi used the coup to execute a scheme. But there were many other casualties. Raila Odinga was a casualty. His involvement in this coup is yet to be resolved, but Arab Moi victimized Raila, fairly or not, using the coup. University lecturers critical of Moy were also casualties. This is how Dr. Willie Mutunga, Professor Katana Mkanga, Professor Edward Oyugi, Professor Ngodo Kariuki, and other radical thinkers were detained without trial. Moy was on a mission to avenge his haters. The extreme of this avenge was Moy closing down the only university in Kenya for one year, two months. Yes, for 14 months, Kenya did not have a running university. The question to the country, therefore, is this. Was the coup a good disruption or not? If history teaches us that we learn nothing from history, what does this coup attempt teach us? We must return to our original quote from a Spanish philosopher. Those who pay little attention to their history are bound to repeat it. Or what do you think?